Our first speaker today, we're going to introduce Daniel Butafuco. I just met Dan just this morning. Wonderful fellow. I'm looking forward to this presentation, and I'm, I'm sure you are as well. He's going to be speaking about are the, all the things that we believe are evil, are they really evil? Or do some things, as we look back at them, turn out to really be a blessing in disguise? Dan is senior partner and founder of Butafuco & Associates, which he began in 1981 after graduated from Hofstra University School of Law. He has since then been voted best lawyer five years in a row and been the recipient of the prestigious Super Lawyer Certificate that is awarded only to the top five attorneys in the country. He's a regular guest on many New York City radio stations such as WMCA, Star 99.1, WLIX, as a legal authority, philanthropist, and defender of the faith. He completed his master's degree at Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack. He's the founder of the Historical Bible Society, which exists to foster the care, preservation, display, and education of ancient and historically significant Bibles, important religious artworks, and the study of Christian scriptures. So let me introduce Dan as he speaks on what is intended as evil, God intends for good, some real life examples. like Marco Rubio and lunge for the water. Thank you for having me. This is kind of uh, important to speak on these topics, especially in today's world, where before you can give people the gospel, you have to engage in what we call pre-evangelism because you have, sort of have to clear the weeds away because people don't even know basic stuff that we took for granted, you know, 50, 100 years ago. Let me begin by speaking about the problem of evil and, and defining what exactly the problem of evil is. Uh, essentially, the argument goes something like this. How can there be an omnipotent and simultaneously good God with all of the evil that is evident in the world? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that there is much evil in the world. You just have to turn on the news. Uh, so this, this, this presents a problem. Either God, as the argument goes, either God is not omnipotent, namely that he's unable or impotent to solve the problem, or God is not good because he permits the evil to afflict people in this world and does nothing to alleviate the suffering. So take your choice, Christian. Your God is either impotent or he's evil. And that's the argument that is, is curled in our faces. So what this uh, seminar or, or talk today is going to be about is we are going to mount what's called a theodicy. Fancy word, a theodicy. It's basically a defense of God's goodness in the face of evil and the advancement of reasons for why God permits evil. And that's what a theodicy is. So uh, evil does exist, this much is evident. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, a Christian apologist at the turn of the last century, said, when belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from him. But in heaven's name, to what? Christians have an obligation to answer these questions when raised by honest truth seekers. But keep in mind that uh, the questioner also has an obligation to explain how do they explain the problem of evil in the world. It's not just a Christian question. According to Ravi Zacharias, uh, my friend and my former professor, the atheist must not, must not only answer the question, but also justify the very question itself. In other words, why is an explanation even needed for evil, pain, and sorrow if there is no meaning to life, and if all we are are the uh, is the product of blind evolutionary processes, because then the inevitable conclusion would be evil just happens. And that's not a very satisfying answer. So Christians have to answer, you know, why does evil exist? Why does God permit evil? And so let's, let's look at that question a little bit. First of all, let's look at some hidden assumptions behind the question or behind the problem. First of all, we need to define what evil is. Let's define evil. Let's start with that. Evil defined, the absence 
lack of or corruption of good, a departure from the way things ought to be. Now, I want you to notice the word departure from thing, the way the things ought to be, the words ought to be, because it presupposes a standard of goodness as to how things ought to be. That's, that's part of the definition of evil. So now we have to ask, well, from whose viewpoint? How should things ought to be? Are we asking it from Billy Graham's viewpoint? Or are we asking it from Adolf Hitler's viewpoint, the way things ought to be? Billy Graham is alleged to have prayed that if he would ever be inclined to fall morally, he prayed that God would take his life because he would rather be removed from this earth rather than to bring disgrace on the name of Jesus by committing a major sin and discrediting his entire testimony. So to Billy Graham, clearly, death wasn't the greatest evil. The greatest evil to him was be to disgrace his king, his God. So it really depends who you, who you speak to when you talk about what exactly is evil. If you talk to my son-in-law, the greatest evil in the world would be uh, the Yankees beating the Mets in the World Series. To him, that would be the greatest evil in the world. Uh, getting more serious, if you were to a able to speak to Adolf Hitler, if you are able to speak to him, the greatest evil in the world to him would be the collapse of the Third Reich. And of course, as thinking people in the, in, in the 21st century, we know that's probably one of the best things that ever happened, the collapse of the Nazi regime. So evil is very much dependent on someone's viewpoint. And the point here is that evil is not, what is evil is not always evident. I want to give you a crazy hypothetical that sort of makes the point of, we don't really know what is bad and what is good when it's happening to us. This is a hypothetical, it's a fictitious story, but I think it makes a point. I woke up late one morning because I forgot to set my alarm. I missed my ride to work. That was bad or evil. The car I was supposed to go into got into an accident. Everyone was killed except me because I wasn't in the car. I was fine. That was good. So I ended up walking to work, but instead I got held up by a robber who hit me on the head, knocked me unconscious. That was evil. The ambulance took me to the hospital where I met a wonderful nurse who later became my wife. That was good. After five years, she ran off with my best friend. That was bad. As a result, I pursued a degree in counseling, and now I counsel people with marital difficulties, wrote a book about my experience, which is a huge success. That's good. When all the money came pouring in, I became materialistic and selfish. I neglected my kids. That was bad. I realized that all the success then was leaving me shallow and unfulfilled, so I began a spiritual journey. That was good. I got into new age. That was bad. Then I met a Christian who told me about Jesus. I got saved. That was good. I tried to live the Christian life, but discipleship is hard. I eventually grew lukewarm in my relationship with God. That was bad. But God sent me an affliction that kept me on my knees praying. That was good. I finished my race strongly. I made it into heaven. That's great. Y you get the point of what I'm saying. We don't know uh, what is good. There are some hidden assumptions in the question of evil. I look back on my life and I, I was thinking before that some of the, the, the greatest things I've ever experienced were seemingly very evil at the time. In 1982, my daughter was born with, uh, with, with a whole host of very serious problems. And, uh, you know, it seemed like that was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. And without getting into all the details, uh, my daughter was miraculously healed. It, it, was, a, it was a difficult time. I'm going I'm to short circuit it for purposes of the talk. But, uh, and we went through a lot, okay? But I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. We didn't have a normal birth where everyone comes in and is so happy and congratulates you for having the child. My daughter was born with a lot of problems. But the bottom line was that, was that when all was said and done, in spite of everything we went through, the heartbreak and, and, and the horror of what had happened, um, it, it worked out fine. It, it enriched our lives immeasurably, so it ended up being something very good. And so what sometimes seems to be evil is not always so. Uh, let's talk about some other hidden assumptions in, in the question um, of, of what, you know, why is there evil in the world? 
Uh, here's, here's a hidden assumption. There cannot possibly be a God with all of the evil and suffering in the world. Can't happen. Like this, this man was saying, and then later on he changed it to say, well, if there is a God, he's a monster. He's a maniac. Well, first of all, why not? Think, think about that. Always look for the hidden assumptions in, in, in people's uh, uh, objections or questions. Why, why can't there be a God just because there's evil in the world? Let's, let's, you know, that'll be explored today, I'm sure, in detail. Um, well, because well, they say, well, God is not all-powerful, or and he cannot prevent that suffering. He would want to do that, wouldn't he? He ought to do it. Well, 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 well why? 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 Again, why not? Why, why, why would God want to do that? Well, because a good and loving God would not, indeed, he ought not permit evil and suffering, as this gentleman in the film just said. He ought not. Now, once you get into the question or the issue of what God should and shouldn't do, you're in very dangerous territory. Because th that's the biggest hidden assumption of all right there, is that you know better than God. Or that you're going to substitute some other value system for the God who created the universe, for the God who gave you life, and you're going to really impose your values as a mere mortal on somebody who's infinitely smarter, infinitely wiser, and infinitely better than you. So once you get into the what God, God ought not to do area, you venture into dangerous uh, territory. Because there's indeed a third possibility, besides God being impotent and unable to solve the problem of evil, or the second possibility, he's not good and loving because he doesn't solve the problem of evil. The third possibility is uh, God permits evil because he has good reasons for permitting it. That's the third logical possibility. And again, there's yet another hidden buried assumption in, that, uh, in these questions, and that is that suffering and pain is meaningless. And we just, we know that that's not true. Some of the greatest things in life, you, you, you can't have certain types of good if you don't have certain types of evil. For example, you cannot have heroism if you don't have real danger. You cannot have a, a firefighter who selflessly runs into a burning building to save a child. You can't have that type of good if you don't have the real evil of the potential of that kid dying or being badly burned, or being badly injured. So there's a hidden assumption that uh, suffering and pain is meaningless. Other types of, of good that you can't have. You can't have uh, selfless sharing if you don't have extreme lack or poverty. You can't have Mother Teresa if you don't have the lepers in India. Uh, you can't have doctors healing people if you don't have uh, sicknesses. And so, so we can go through lots and lots of evil in which gives opportunities for lots and lots of good to occur. Another thing that is a hidden assumption, which is pretty much the reigning philosophy of today's culture and today's society, is that the avoidance of pain and the maximization of pleasure is the highest good. And, and, and you realize that, that that's pretty much how people live these days. Malcolm Muggeridge writes, speaking about the meaning of suffering in his own life, and he was 75 years old when he wrote this, he says, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say that with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world Everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness, whether pursued or attained. In other words, if it were ever possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or some other medical mumbo jumbo, the result would not be to make life delectable, but to make life too banal or trivial to be endurable. This, of course, is what the cross signifies, and it is the cross more than anything that has called me inexorably to Christ. But the point is a good point, which is that suffering is, 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 is a fertile ground to produce character in us and produce rich, rich, a richness in us that we wouldn't have otherwise attained. So 
we have to be really careful when we think that pain and, and, and things that we think are evil are, are evil. They may not be. They, they, that's the topic of my discussion. What, what, what Satan intends for evil, God intends for good. What is sometimes thought to be evil could be the best thing that ever happened to you. And I promised I'd give some real-life examples. I'm going to give some. Um, I, I'll give a real obvious one. I had a client very early on in my career who uh, had who got into a diving accident. He, he, he dove into a, a swimming pool. Don't ever do that uh, if it's shallow. And sadly, he broke his neck and became a, a quadriplegic. His name was Tom. And, of course, I had the case. And these are his words. He would not have become a Christian if it wasn't for that experience. He was a rough and tumble guy. He did not want anything to do with God. And he just believed that, you know, he was good looking, he was making money, and, you know, he just thought he had everything. And this one day, it was 4th of July, I remember it, 30 years ago, he fractured his neck and he ended up paralyzed in a wheelchair, very much like Christopher Reeves. He told me, because I get to see people at some of their worst moments when they're very seriously injured, he told me, had this not happened, I would never be a believer. Now, some might say, it's a big deal, you're a believer. You still have to live your whole life in a wheelchair. But, you know, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the entire soul, uh, entire world, but loses his soul? I mean, it's hard for us to process because we're so temporal, and we think that, you know, this is the whole ball game here, everything that we can see, everything that we can touch. But really, when you inject eternity into the equation, it gives you a whole different perspective on what's important and what life is really all about. And to this guy, Tom, who realized that his eternity was secure in Christ, he was going to spend eternity with God, and he knew that he wasn't going to otherwise, this accident was, was, a, was a turning point in his life. That's a true real-life example. Another real-life example um, is, a, is a young woman I just recently represented, a beautiful girl, a Christian girl, go over to Christian family, uh, Indian family, everybody, literally everybody in her family is a doctor. Um, she's not a doctor. She became a psychologist, super smart, straight A's, Columbia grad school, doing something for the UN. But she got involved because she was very pretty and very musical. She got involved in making these music videos. And uh, she was hanging definitely around with the wrong people. Uh, she gets into a very weird accident. She's walking into... A, into class in, 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 uh, in Manhattan, and a van, the mirror of a van, clips her in the back, and she gets hit in the middle of her back, her head whips back, she doesn't even hit the ground, and she thinks she's fine. She develops a weird constellation of symptoms. She cannot endure sound, and she cannot endure light. Cognitively, she is fine. She got straight A's. She, she continued to school, she graduated with straight A's. But she couldn't tolerate being in front of a computer. She couldn't tolerate sound. She couldn't tolerate light. And she's in my office crying. And I go online. She's telling me about these videos that she does. And I go online. I check out some of these videos. It's a fusion between uh, uh, Tamil, uh, uh, cultural kind of uh, dancing, and rap. OK? So she's found a niche, and people are getting into it. But some of these videos are pretty racy, I have to tell you. OK? And she, she's got no pain. The one thing she cannot do is make music videos. It's the craziest thing ever. And she's crying in my office saying, you know, why did God allow this to happen to me? I was on track for a fantastic career. And I said, to her, did you ever think that this is not something God wants you to do with your life? She said, I, I, she says, it, 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 like the light bulb went on, you know? You know, you're so smart. You have so many other opportunities. You got a, You have a, uh, a, a contract with the UN. She was doing work with uh, women's groups and talking about abused women and other cultures. She was writing eloquently, and she got off track, and she's making these crazy videos. The one thing she can't do is tolerate sound and light. She can't make these videos. It's the craziest thing ever. So is that evil? I guess it depends how you look at it, right? I look at it like if it was my kid, she could be my daughter. She's about my daughter's age. I look at it as a blessing. She looks, she looked, she's looking at it at the beginning as, a, as the worst evil that could happen to her. And uh, as, 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 as this case is unfolding and she's starting to mature and come to grips 
with what's happening, she's realizing that maybe this isn't as evil as she thought. And, and, and I could give you many, many uh, uh, examples of, of things like that. So maybe God has good reasons for permitting what we, we think is evil. So what then is, is the greatest evil? You know, society says the greatest evil is the, uh, uh, is the is, well, the greatest good is the maximization of pleasure and avoidance of pain. And if you reverse that, the greatest evil is, is pain uh, and the minimization of pleasure. So if, if that's not true, what is the greatest evil? Um, modern society deems, uh, as I said, uh, pain and actually death to be the greatest evil, generally. In fact, uh, if you just take somewhat close attention to the, the reigning philosophy that's evident in books and movies and shows and news, uh, you will come to the conclusion that just generally people believe death to be the greatest evil because it's, it's so final, right? What is it? If, if death is the cessation of existence completely, then I would agree. It's arguably the greatest evil because it's all over. But if death is a doorway into another realm, into something greater, a better reality than we have now, where we clearly see a broken world and lots of problems. If death is a doorway into a better reality, a greater realm, then clearly death is not the greatest evil. And so this is where worldview becomes important. Uh, we, as Christians, have a biblical worldview as Jesus had. And what is that worldview? Well, it's, I stated it somewhat before, you know, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Isaiah 57.1 is a fantastic scripture, often overlooked. It says, the righteous perish, and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away. They die. And no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Think about that scripture for a minute. Clearly to Isaiah, death wasn't the greatest evil. Because implicit in that verse is the idea that by being taken away in death, it was opening up to something else and you were actually being spared from evil. This was a verse that was very comforting to my mother-in-law when she lost her son, my wife's brother, at 21 years of age. They went to wake him up for church on a Sunday morning. He wasn't doing drugs. He wasn't involved in anything that we know of. They went to wake him up for church. He was dead in his bed. And I, I was able to speak to the medical examiner because she happened to be a friend of mine that did the autopsy. And he died from a, a very rare medical condition that was related to sleep apnea, 21 years of age. And so how do you make sense out of that? How do you process that? My mother-in-law was a wreck. She's a woman of strong faith. He was a Christian, Ricky. Um, I was sitting in the hot tub with him. He died Saturday night. Friday night, I was sitting in the hot tub with Ricky. And he says to me, I'll never forget this. He says to me, he called me bro. He says, bro, he said, uh, what do you think was the purpose of my life? I said, I don't know, Ricky. I said, that's what I'm trying to find out. Everybody's trying to find that out. You have to find that out for yourself. He said, well, I think I know what the purpose of my life was. This was the Friday before he died. We never talked like this. He wasn't a deep spiritual guy. He says, I think I know what the purpose of my life was. He said, uh, when I was born, you know, I had touch of cerebral palsy, he goes, and I was healed. It's a true story. He says, and that's how my family came to the Lord. And he, he says, that's why we're in church, because of me. I said, yeah, I guess that's true, Ricky. That was in 1967 when he was born. And uh, I said, but I'm, I'm sure that's not the only purpose of your life. And he says, no, nah. he says, you know, you wouldn't have even met my sister if it wasn't for me, because you met in church. He says, in fact, your daughter wouldn't be born if it wasn't for me. This is the conversation we're having in the hot tub. And, uh, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, where's this all coming from? And he says, yeah, I think that was the reason for my life. I said, well, Ricky, I think God has more for you. You know, what did I know? That was Friday. Sunday, he was dead. I told that story at the wake. Why did the righteous perish? The righteous perish, and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. You see, we trust that God knows better than we do. We don't, I don't know, we don't know what could have, would have happened to Ricky had he been permitted uh, to be, uh, to live to, you know, 100 years of age. I was talking to Julie about this before, you know. What, how are you going to exit this world? What, what, what's the ideal, to live to 100, you know, and, and die in your sleep? 
or being like George Beverly Shea, live to 104, die at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee in your hand and a cookie in your mouth. That's a true story. Um, or, or to die suddenly. You know, some people say die young, leave a good looking corpse. Uh, you have two choices, basically. You're either going to rot slowly or you're going to die suddenly. I'm not sure which is worse. I, you know, I really don't know. But the point here is that belief in eternity after death changes everything. Arguably anything, any evil, no matter how bad, no matter how severe it is, that happens on earth is insignificant in light of an eternal perspective, which is why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we do not grieve as those without hope. You see, the greatest evil is not death. The greatest evil is not pain. The greatest evil and the greatest aim of evil, and if you want to personalize it, the greatest aim of the evil one is not death, but destruction. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. Notice that's progressive. Steal, he'll take something from you. Kill, he'll kill you. And if you let him, he'll destroy you. It gets progressively worse. Steal, kill, destroy. Jesus said, though, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Jesus here clearly is speaking of eternal life, which begins when you encounter God in, in, in a saving way. And so we see that the greatest evil is not death. It's not the stealing of your stuff. The greatest evil is your destruction, your eternal destruction, from which there is no hope. And then there is no hope of eternity. Um, there are some real-life examples. For example, Job is a great example of somebody who suffered horribly. No matter how bad you have it, you don't have it as bad as Job. He didn't lose one kid. He lost 10 kids. My mother-in-law lost one kid. Job lost 10 kids, right? He didn't have one thing stolen from him. How many made a bad investment? I had some money with Bernie Madoff. I lost $40,000. Fortunately, it was only $40,000. But you know what? That's only $40,000. Job lost everything, right? Some people complain or they feel it's evil. I thought it was the worst evil in the world when I was 17 and I had acne, bad acne. I remember crying on my bed. You know, Job had boils. He's scraping himself with a pot, sir. Okay? But... Job was unaware of the divine drama that was playing out uh, in a cosmic way, and he had no idea he was going to make it into scripture. I'm sure of that. I think now Job is quite content with what happened. But what's really interesting about the life of Job, and I find this fascinating, at the end, God gave Job double of everything, right? But he didn't give him double kids. He gave him exactly the same amount of kids that he started with. Seven sons and three daughters. Why? Why is that? Because he never took the other ten away. He only borrowed them for a little while. Think about that. Read the end of Job. It says Job started out with seven kids, uh, uh, ten kids. They all were killed, right? At the end of Job, God gives Job everything double. Double camels, double tents, you name it, double. To your shame, you'll have double, he gives them. But when it comes to kids... It says Job got another seven sons and another three daughters. Not double, exactly what he started with, because now he's had double, in effect, because the first ten are still alive. They're just in heaven. God didn't take them. He only borrowed them. Let's look at uh, Joseph, the life of Joseph, right? Type of Christ, in a sense, right? Joseph clearly had a call on his life. God was going to use him for something fantastic. When I said I'd give real-life examples. I also meant biblical examples, because that's real life to me. When, when Joseph, you know, was a young man, he sort of was a little bit full of himself, right? He had a couple of dreams in which uh, his parents and his brothers are bowing down to him. Not a good idea to tell that to your brothers. I would think, you know, if I had something like that, I'd probably keep it to myself, right? Maybe not. If you know me, I probably would say something. But, 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 Job, but Joseph tells his, his father and his mother and his brothers and sisters, and you can just see the steam coming out of their ears when he tells them this, right? You know, I had a dream that you bowed down to me and worshipped me as king. Now, it was all true. But that didn't seem to matter because they didn't like it. All right? And Joseph, as you know, has to go through a horrible ordeal, right? He ends up in the pit. Then he's not in the pit. He ends up sold as a slave. Then he's 
in, in a household where he's trying to do good and he gets wrongfully accused. Then he gets wrongfully accused. He ends up in prison where he languishes. God's working on his heart. You know that, right? Preparing him. And that's a representative sort of, of like uh, separation. And then all of a sudden, Job, uh, Joseph is elevated to, to the right hand of God, Pharaoh, the type of Christ. And we see that when he meets his brothers at the end, and they're terrified that he's going to wreak judgment upon them and inflict pe penalties, he said, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. You see, you see, the point there is that what seemed to be evil was actually very good. It formed Joseph, was very formative for Joseph, and made him the man that God wanted him to be. It's one of the problems, I mean, one of the prayers I pray constantly is, God, make me the man you want me to be. Not the man I want to be, but the man you want me to be. I think that's a good prayer. Um, it's a little bit of a dangerous prayer, I think, because you, you may invite some trials and tribulations in the process, but but it, uh, it, it is a good prayer. I, I prayed that prayer uh, about 15 years ago for the first time, and I went through a horrible experience. I'm not going to share it with you in, in, in detail, but I will tell you that it, I was up at night. I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't really tell anybody. It, had, it, was, it, was, it was an immoral failing or anything like that. It was a, I got involved in business with somebody who obligated me for millions and millions of dollars. And uh, I was really in danger of losing everything I worked for. It was, it was a mess. And I couldn't even share it with my own family. And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't worry, I'm getting you out of this. And I had to hang on to that. But in the process, I look back on that, so many awesome things came out of that. I wouldn't even actually be here talking to you if it wasn't for that experience. And uh, maybe if you pull me aside later, I can elaborate a little bit. But, you know, now I'm glad it happened. At the time, it was the worst thing I thought that could possibly have befallen me. And so what, God in, what, what, what Satan intends for evil, God intends for good. It's really how you respond to these things that really defines what happens. I'm going to give you one more example, and then, and then I'm done. If you think about the greatest evil that has ever happened in the history of the world, it's very simple. Jesus Christ, an honest good, sinless man, comes into the world, does nothing but going around doing good and healing the sick and preaching, preaching uh, you know, deliverance, right? Never hurts anybody, never sins. And what does mankind do to him? We take this innocent man and we, we reject him and we torture him and we dishonor him and we crucify, we murder him, right? Arguably, the greatest evil that has ever happened in the history of the world. I'm a justice guy. I'm a lawyer. To me, that's the most unjust thing. Every, even now when I read the Gospels, even though I know how it's going to end, I'm hoping that Pilate pardons Jesus, right? Because it's just so difficult to read. It's the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. Simultaneously, it's the best thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. How could that possibly be? Only God could do that. Only God could do that. Ponder that. Thank you very much.